ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Global Entrepreneurship Summit presented by the Entrepreneur Entrepreneurial Ventures of Arabia. We have an exciting lineup of sessions over the next two days, which will be led and presented by some of the most dynamic local, regional, and international leaders in entrepreneurship and SMEs. I encourage all of you to take full advantage of the program's features and wish you an engaging and successful summit. So without further delay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first moderator, who will lead our opening panel discussion entitled, Global Conversation with Policymakers, Best Practices in Entrepreneurship and SME Developments. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Ortmans, President of Global Entrepreneurship and Senior Fellow at the Kauffman Foundation in the United States of America. Jonathan. Thank you very much. Well, this is very, very exciting. Thank you very much indeed for having me. And uh, a special thanks to the uh, higher Colleges of Technology. Um, at the Kauffman Foundation, we have been deeply honored by our relationship with uh, Dr. Tayyab Kamali and uh, uh, Sheikh Nahan for their extraordinary leadership in uh, keeping the momentum, at trying to inspire and uh, support and train uh, more people uh, in entrepreneurship. And at the Kauffman Foundation, we greatly value our partnership and appreciate being part of this. Um, you know, this is uh, an extraordinarily exciting time for all of us because entrepreneurs now around the world represent more than something of commercial significance. They represent what I call the possibility of human endeavor. They can bring the best out of all of us in our, better, in our, in our effort to uh, find new ways of doing things and finding uh, better paths for our fellow citizens to adopt. And of course, we all know it's the entrepreneurs uh, that will innovate us out of through hard economic times. It's the entrepreneurs and our new and young firms in particular who are the ones who are generating uh, the new jobs. Uh, certainly, if you look at an increasing amount of data around the United States, something we at the Coffin Foundation love, you'll find that almost all of the net new jobs are coming from firms under five years old. And so it is with special honor that uh, I welcome to the stage our panel here to have a discussion about how we best foster this uh, in the region. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite up to the panel, uh, uh, invite up onto the stage my, my fe fellow panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, since you came furthest, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, my colleague Horatio Mello from uh, Startup Chile. Uh, Professor uh, Bulent uh, Gultikin, from, uh, who's come, come all the way from uh, Wharton in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, Abdul Al uh, Janahi. Please join us from uh, Dubai uh, uh, SME. And uh, last and most certainly not least, uh, I think we'll be joining us in a minute, um, Abdullah Al Damaki, who, as you know, is the CEO of the Khalifa Fund. Um, we're gonna, I, w I wanted to see if we could uh, begin our conversation this morning by um, perhaps uh, asking each of you uh, to talk a little bit about um, what do you think we mean about the word entrepreneur? Um, it, this is uh, a revolution happening around the world, but to what degree are we talking about, uh, 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 is it small businesses, is it founders of businesses, is it uh, uh, high growth firms, is it all of these? And I perhaps begin with this question because it's perhaps vital for us to know who it is we think that our efforts are going to support. So um, maybe we could we could begin by me, me asking asking you uh, uh, as we embark upon our conversation. Uh, maybe we think about you know who it is that you think we, we should be targeting. Um, to answer that question, first I believe that the entrepreneurs is almost everyone. So in, even in big corporations, you can find people that internally become entrepreneurs and do new stuff. Um, but when we change the question for who are targeting specifically in our case, 
we are targeting early stage, high potential growth entrepreneurs, which is a completely different approach. And of course, it's a part of this full target. Um, but I believe the most important quality that these people in particular has is related on, on how, ma how much they push and how willing are they to change the status quo and all the stuff that already exists. I believe that's the main characteristic of this specific target that is behind startups or how potential growth companies in general. Okay. All right, I think the entrepreneur could be anywhere and it could be a different size. And I'm in academia, we have academic entrepreneurs. What I sort of uh, call an entrepreneur, someone who creates value, who creates something new, who does or thinks something that nobody else thought before and he cannot really fit into the boundaries that is defined by him and then he does things or he creates a new entity if it is an academia creates a new program but often on an economic life because my background is also in policy making is to come up with the individuals who develop businesses in any sector you can think of and any size, but off and on, really, the entrepreneur that we mean, as Horacio said, is the people who start new businesses okay. in different areas. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, this is the big question. It's like the big bang uh, question of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, based on our experience in the past 10 years, and I think for uh, looking at the 12,000 people who walked into our offices. Uh, all of them, some of them are wannabe entrepreneurs, some of them think they are entrepreneurs, some of them think entrepreneurship is the trend, and some of them are entrepreneurs. Uh, and I believe uh, we as organizations, as people, as communities, ac as academia, we should put the right platform for all of them to, to flourish then who makes it? I think those are the people that we need to focus on and take them to the next level. Okay, so uh, 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 Khalifa, you must have, yeah, sorry. Maybe you two can share. Well, to start with, first of all, if, if we're talking in the context of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, uh, the objective of, the objective of uh, setting up Khalifa Fund was to empower all Emiratis in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi to potentially look at themselves as entrepreneurs. Obviously not everyone uh, fits the criteria for that matter, but over the last five years we put uh, certain methodologies to kind of spiff through those that are, um, and some of them are for social circumstances, uh, are a focus for an SME development agency like Khalifa Fund to empower them and to give them the ability to become self-employed and self-reliant uh, going forward. Uh, however, now in the context of the UAE, because that's what Khalifa Fund does now, we, are, we cover the whole of the Emirates, um, we are focusing on different groups of the demographics. So the youth population is a priority for us. Uh, female entrepreneurs are of also uh, importance and focus for us, so we have designed programs for them. Uh, and even those of special care needs, we have focused with them and we have developed certain initiatives that target the, the ability for them to become more productive and, and more acceptable in society. So okay. I, think, I think in a nutshell, it's, it's more of towards, um, you know, our entrepreneurs are the, those UAE nationals who are looking to uh, better the lifestyle and to become more uh, embedded into society. For that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Well, it, it, it looks like uh, for many of our societies, and certainly in the work that we do at the Coffee Foundation, we're in 130 countries, we realize that the target audience is going to vary. Um, but I, I, I wanted to start with that question so that we have a sense of, uh, if, if we're looking at, as this panel asks, shared best practices as to ways that we can learn from each other about how best to answer our entrepreneurs, we probably need to also answer it in the context of who we're, who we're helping. So uh, let me uh, go back to you, Horatio, if I can, and uh, have you tell us a little bit about the model that your government uh, in Chile came up with and maybe why and, and, and what it is you're doing and is there much uh, of relevance to this part of the world? Well, in simple words, Startup Chile is a program from the Chilean government that aims to attract early stage entrepreneurs to start their businesses in Chile. Uh, for that we provide 40k equity free 
and one year working visa, which so is extendable. $40,000. So $40,000 equity free. Um, and why we do this, and probably is the most important part, is because our theory is that Chile is very isolated geographically, so that isolation generates um, mental isolation. So we don't think our ideas are big enough or can be globally or, or can go global after a few months. So in that line, attracting entrepreneurs from all around the world, it helps and it push a lot to make sure we create an ecosystem and we create or we help that all the key players in the ecosystem do their job at the end. Um, one of the most important things so far is that even when we are part of the government, the program works as we are a startup funded by the government. And that makes all the difference because we avoid all the bureaucracy that normally government has and should have for many reasons. Um, we avoid to be slow and we took decisions very fast. And the most important part is we iterate a lot because we collect feedback constantly and we are improving the program based on what entrepreneurs need. And having said that, for us, that's the entrepreneurs is in, is in the centric of our organization. So all the stuff that we do are full focus on the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs' needs in general. Um, so thinking like how other governments or how other countries can reapply something like that, there are two important points. The first one is should be, it cannot be a reapplication like 100% equal. It should have some details that change based on, the, um, on the, uh, the problems or issues that we want to address. And secondly, even if it's part of the government, it should be a different organization that have all the flexibility that entrepreneurs, or especially high potential entrepreneurs, needs to have. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know, for example, that model wouldn't work in the United States. Uh, the United States is a country that's got a real sort of immigration challenging uh, environment that uh, lots of entrepreneurs would like to stay there and start companies and can't. Uh, but, but let's just sort of ask this, this notion of importing a few people, uh, is this something that uh, would be relevant, you think, in this part of the world? Would it work? And if it would, uh, why? And if it wouldn't, why? Maybe I could, I could, I could begin by, by, uh, by asking from the Dubai perspective I think the, chal the, the challenges are, are totally different uh, in the Arab world and uh, specifically in the GCC. Uh, we, don't, we have a good flux of entrepreneurs who come to our region because of uh, opportunities and the ease of doing business. Um, both of us, me and Abdullah, as organizations, are focusing on uh, developing the uh, homegrown uh, entrepreneurship and homegrown small medium enterprises. Uh, so uh, talking about best practices, um, I think we, we should not uh, just import things when it comes to, to specific uh, programs, which, uh, either if it's in Chile or if it's in other countries, we can look at the, these models and learn specific things that maybe uh, uh, we can accommodate here. But uh, copying it 100% because, because it's a best practice, is, 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 uh, I think it's not the, ra the right way to do it. But uh, I think we should create our own uh, best practices. Uh, we want our people uh, to be entrepreneurs. We want them to get involved in, in the economic development and prosperity of this, of this nation. Uh, so going back to your question, uh, best practices, yes, are there. It's good to look at it, but we need to take just bits and pieces that works for this, yep. for, for this uh, region. So, um, Abdul, if I could turn to you for a minute. Um, I know uh, if I was to follow through on um, Horatio Mello's concept here, I, I think you would tell us, Horatio, that uh, it's, it's about helping to build the culture and the communities that create more homegrown entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, it's not just about those 40 people that come in from, they're, they're really the catalyst, is that, is, is that right? So uh, what are your perspectives on, on this notion of, you know, importing? Because for those of us outside the region, we've seen this part of the world do a phenomenal job at bringing in some of the best educational institutions. And so we, 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 we sort of, we, we ponder this question, you know, how, how helpful could we be in having other entrepreneurs uh, share societal uh, experiences? The, um, the model in Chile is a very aggressive one, and I, I applaud my, my colleague here for what they've, they've done. First of all, let's talk about the population. Today, you know, we as citizens of this country and, and the GC, we are, we are a minority in our own society. And so 
you know, in some countries where you know government would step in and and and, and provide aggressive financing, so so that these companies can come and start and create more jobs, is is a welcoming factor. Uh, in the context of the Arab world, and like my colleague Mr. Abbasad said, um, we we don't have that problem. What we do have a problem is that it's a cultural thing where people need to be educated um, on the potential uh, of becoming entrepreneurs and and, and in essence, uh, you know, the the role of a small and medium enterprise in society and economy. So um, you know, the Khalifa Fund model uh, primarily talks about investing in the Emirati population. That's our primary objective. Um, yes, we do acknowledge that you know there's about over 60% of the po growing population is of, of a certain age, the youth population, and so we look towards fostering entrepreneurs by undertaking certain initiatives, especially with the schools and universities and what have you, so that you know in the future we have uh, a more capable society of understanding exactly what it is to become an entrepreneur. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know we are an organization that's fully funded by the government, like uh, the, the model in Chile. And so we are, we are able to provide soft loans uh, uh, to, to those uh, potential entrepreneurs and we work with them towards getting them, uh, giving them the ability to become more successful by undertaking uh, additional initiatives, uh, creating the platform and infrastructure for them to uh, be a bit more prosperous okay. should, should, should that not be available. In the well, um, perhaps if, if, if not bringing in, uh, not, not importing entrepreneurs is, you know, may, maybe the, the, the bigger priority, but better training existing um, Emiratis here. Um, Bula, maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience in this regard, because this is... Uh yeah, let me <coughs> put it, even though um, Jonathan introduced me as a former governor and a professor, which is true, but I had another job before... I be, took the job as a governor. I was, Keep the mic close I was in charge of a, a, the, one of the largest agencies in Turkey, and one of my job was to develop new businesses and entrepreneurship in the country. And also I was in charge of privatization programs. So we were doing two things completely opposite. On one hand, I was in charge of, I was the minister for privatization, tried to privatize the Turkish state and own enterprises yet at the same time built new sectors, especially in the less developed parts of the country and also in the export sector. So uh, that's when I stumbled or at least had to deal with the question of uh, entrepreneurship and the policy making. And I think I can give you more lessons about how not to do things rather than how to do things because I had some miserable failures and more than successes. So as a result, it's, it's also important to look at the failures. But I think in the question of developing a policy, what is important is to identify your objectives. And once you identify your objectives, then you can set the right tools. And because in the context of Chile, I'm glad Horatio is here, because Chile has been always an interesting example. We followed in Turkey, Chilean privatization example. They seem to be 10 years ahead of Turkey at the time, and still seem to be 10 years ahead on the entrepreneurship side. Their idea for bringing entrepreneurs from outside is to compete in the high-tech area because how in the world are you going to do that? And now U.S. has this visa restrictions, U.K. has visa restrictions. Now there is an opportunity. You invite entrepreneurs and provide them the means. You get the best and the brightest talent, which was the hallmark of the United States. And Chile emerged as really a new hub out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So that's important. So their objective was different. In our case, we were trying to build export sector and we didn't have, we didn't do it suddenly because we did the brute way because we didn't have the infrastructure so we provided massive incentives for entrepreneurs, created a lot of waste at the beginning that is inevitable. I mean anyone who's in the venture business knows that if you get two companies out of ten you're lucky. So. That caused a lot of political problems, but that's something you have to endure and explain people that's the nature of the game. And the other thing, it takes really long time. Whatever you do, it takes much longer than you realize because changing societies is like raising children. It's even more difficult. When you raise one children, you can focus, but in a society you have in different stages. So it takes at least four times longer to change the environment. So as a result, Again, developing policy, what is objectives? In this part of the world, I always argue that we should think regionally. The reason for that, the scale issue. And we want to develop the local talent, 
But at the same time, if we have the opportunity to bring the rest of the world, because you guys are so far ahead compared to what I had to deal 25 years ago in Turkey, is unbelievable. I'm jealous of these guys. <laughs> They're the best sort of uh, consultants. They can really monitor them. So as a result, they can really focus and do more. And so the question is, you can develop really a regional platform here because look at the whole Middle East. It's in turmoil. This is the island of stability. Yep. So you can bring best and the brightest at no cost whatsoever and tag along with it. Yep. So that's what I would see as a policy making while just helping the Emirates and building the know-how and talent, yet at the same time, create this massive platform for the benefit of the entire region. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to come back, if we can, to Dubai SME and to Khalifa and ask you both. Um, you know, I, th I think we, we enjoy around the world now um, uh, a wide array of people developing both research and programs to, support, to solve different problems. And I think what we were hearing, Bulan, from you was that uh, you first of all have to work out what are, your, what are your objectives. I know at the Coffin Foundation we advise many, many governments around the world. And the most confusing thing for me is the ministers often I talk to can't answer the first question I have, which is, what's your objective? Is it job creation? Uh, is your objective that you want to uh, unleash more of your innovative capacity? Uh, is it uh, economic growth? Uh, you know, there's a variety of things you could ask. So um, what I'd like to really do is if we could turn here and say, to the extent that there's a very, uh, shall I say, uh, willing global community that wants to be as helpful as possible to your mission to home grow um, the, the, the greatest potential of, um, of, of entrepreneurial talent here, what would you say are the biggest challenges? Are the biggest challenges still uh, in entrepreneurship education? Are they... Uh, you know, what, what are the biggest challenges that uh, you, you think are faced by the region? Either of you wish to go first? Um, I'll go first. You have the mic then. No. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Okay. Um, first and foremost, um, let's, let's be clear about the fact that entrepreneurship is something you cannot teach. This is something that's embedded at a very early stage in the school curriculum. And that doesn't exist right now or it's at yet to be seen. Uh, if you look at the education strategy, all over the GCC. I'm not talking about the UAE here. Uh, second of all, and, and these are two more fundamental issues, and that is the ability to take risk and the ability to accept failure more than once. These are some characteristics that don't exist in the, I would say, in the context of the UAE, in the Emirati uh, potential entrepreneurs. And so if you can't have that, then it's, it's very difficult for any agency, uh, be it an SME development agency, be it a policy making uh, uh, entity, to be able to ensure the, the prospect growth of uh, SMEs. Um, the fact that, you know, just recently, uh, I think it was yesterday that the announcement was made uh, on a federal level that there is the definition for small and medium enterprise is a welcoming factor, but I don't think it stops there. I think the fact that we, we do need uh, a bankruptcy law, we do require an amendment to the labor law where there should be a civil rights law for the citizens of the country like there is in the United States or any other country. So these, I would, I would say these are the main pillars uh, to ensure that there is a more prosperous um, role of a small and medium enterprise. In terms of what are the objective and the question that we were asking about it with the ministers, I think in the, U in the UAE in general, the objective is to give a better lifestyle for the Emirati population. It's not, it's not a matter about job creation. I think we have more jobs than we have the, the population. I think that's why we, have, we see an influx of expatriates coming into the, U, to the UAE. But the ability to give a better lifestyle, a, uh, an improved lifestyle, and, and, a, and a better education, for the, for the, especially for the young, younger generation, is of greater importance than it is uh, of an economic role. Because the, the government will continue to support the economy and uh, give, that, uh, give that ability going forward. OK. Go ahead. Uh, my take on this is, uh, one, there is another question, because I think uh, in the media, uh, I don't know if everybody agrees with me, everybody's talking about small medium enterprises, everyone, the ministers, the uh, education, the academia, uh, in terms of will small SMEs create jobs. Uh, I think the situation differs in every region. Uh, if it's in Egypt, yes, it might create jobs. But here I think we are more of into uh, 
self-employment uh, because uh, the lifestyle, again, as Abdullah said, is totally different than, than the rest of the region. That's why we go back to in terms of best practices. You, you just cannot apply a specific uh, model uh, right. in, in every, uh, every single region. Um, that, that's the question that needs to be really agreed on. Uh, we get pressure from, from ministries in terms of uh, uh, if you support a UAE national entrepreneur, how many jobs for nationals uh, they can create. Uh, I'll be very honest, they cannot create jobs for other than their family if they are willing to be paid less and be part of the venture itself. Uh, so that's, that's the big question that needs to be answered uh, specifically in the GCC. We, we're talking about a drive into entrepreneurship and SMEs to be self-employed. Mm -hmm. uh, point two is really from uh, the policy makers perspective. I think uh, I totally agree uh, with, with Abdullah uh, when it comes to uh, bankruptcy law and uh, we have a big issue uh, of uh, government employees. Uh, everybody wants to work for the government and as, as soon as you get involved uh, in the government uh, workforce uh, you, and the security of that is very difficult for you to leave and if you leave and this is one of the things that we have recommended uh, is really uh, for the pension fund you, you, you are, you are uh, getting out of the umbrella of the security of the government mm -hmm. and you are on your own uh, so that, that needs to be looked at uh, the other thing is I think when it comes to the financial sector still the financial sector looks at businesses as individuals uh, and they take uh, personal guarantees from people, uh, from entrepreneurs. They do not spend the right time and the right effort. Actually, they don't have even the right people to do the right evaluation of these small medium enterprises. Uh, one last thing is really uh, when it comes to the angel investors the community, because we, we do not, we cannot uh, ask the banks, which, which are uh, commercially driven, to help entrepreneurs uh, which are startups for, uh, sp specifically on the first three years. So we need more of the, uh, the big entrepreneurs, the business people, the community to come together, the families. We need to go back to the roots, the families, the friends, they need to help each other to become angel investors. You cannot just come and say, I will come and uh, ask the banks to be angel investors. They're not supposed to do that. Right. So, uh, so um, well, I'm, I'm going to see if I can get our international guests to, to respond to a couple of those things, and let's just to take a few of those challenges and see if there's any, any, any suggestions here. I mean, uh, I, I think on the policy front, um, obviously, um, uh, the United States is probably a pretty good example, and I should probably mention the United States because of the fact this summit has been done in partnership with uh, the United States government. Uh, and this is actually, believe it or not, people think America is this most entrepreneurial country, but it's really only in the last 12 to 18 months that the U.S. government has done new policies specifically to support startups, new and young firms. First time in history. Um, and of course it was because they said their mission was job creation, they realized most of the jobs were coming from those firms, which in the United States is true, may, may, not, may not be here true. Um, but I think one of the things that can occur is to look at what are the required uh, policy steps to move away and I think it's probably not in the role of our role to be talking about how do you uh, enforce bankruptcy laws here and so forth so but I think we've we've we've, we've noted that as being the, you know certainly a challenge that be done from the region probably more relevant for us to comment on on some of the other issues associated with you know, the culture of failure and some of those. So I, do either of you want to comment yeah, on those? I, I want to make, because I seem to have nowadays three hats. One, I'm a professor in the uh, United States, and second, I'm a former policymaker, and third, I'm a research center of Wharton in Abu Dhabi. So we have a research center for the region. So as a result, uh, and also that means I'm a very confused, I have a very confused mind, but that's okay. But one thing that I want to, repeat here again, it should not be a, a waste of time. Culture, especially, not the, or fear of failure is an important element in our cultures. So here we worry about failing so much that we don't sometimes attempt to do things. One thing I learned in the United States, which was a tremendous cultural shock to me, in the States, 
failure is not an embarrassment. It's not to attempt is an embarrassment. If you fail, that's fine. Everyone understand that because if you don't do, if you don't try to do anything, people would probably yeah. take an issue. So that's cultural. It takes. But I think a while. the question is, how do you change that? I mean, it uh, really takes a time. I mean. What happened, this is the issue I was telling you in Turkey. I lived throughout the last 30 years. I left as a student, graduate student, and felt guilty, came back and, and worked for the government for a number of years. I still spent half of my time in Turkey. It started with a very visionary person, a prime minister, Özal. He changed the direction of the country. And what he did, he told people it's okay to be businessman, it's okay to fail, and whenever he traveled abroad, he used to literally take the entire DC-10 those days, the largest plane, businessman to, along with him. So basically, it, was, it started at the very top. And so that can be done, but it takes, right. it takes a while. The other part is the, the, the issue in these things is the stage of development that is there are certain things, in order to, I think your point is very well taken. When you try to apply something from one country or from one experience, you have to understand the context. At what level of development or at what stage they are doing things. So I use a lot of advices in my life when I was in the government or later on I designed the privatization program in Poland. I was an advisor. I had no idea about the country. So instead of telling them what to do, I had to tell them what we did so they can draw lessons from that. So it's important, the level of development and the stage. And right now in Turkey, we're facing the same problems. Culturally, it's a great thing to be an entrepreneur. No one wants to go to public sector. Everyone goes to private. But then institutions, especially, we're stuck with the financing side because we don't have the institutions which would provide funding for risk capital. Banks cannot do that. Banks should not provide risk capital. They're not in that business. So that sort of environment is needed at that stage, especially if you're dealing with startups. Yep. In the case of SMEs, for example, what we had to do, it's not so much financing per se, but we provided infrastructure. We provided what we call the uh, industrial zones organized industrial zone, essentially developed regions outside of the cities and provided almost free rent and later ownership to the entrepreneurs. You can open up a shop, it could be a work shop, and then eventually now today, for example, we were, I'll tell you the numbers, so it should give you a lot of uh, encouragement to people. When we started reforms in 1980, exports of Turkey was three billion all agricultural. Today it's 130 billion, almost all manufacturing. And today, if you look at the underhood of BMW or Mercedes, probably 60% of the parts are coming from Turkey. That's how it really changed in a way. Right. Let me, um, Horatio, I want to br bring you in on this. I mean, one of the things that um, we know you've seen uh, from a global perspective, and certainly us with Global Entrepreneurship Week, we've now got uh, this uh, phenomenal, literally thousands of communities of entrepreneurs that seem to have a lot in common no matter what the cultural uh, community that they come from. Um, so uh, to, to what degree is this challenge around failure actually getting addressed by the fact that people are no longer thinking it as being, I start, I fail, but I form a team, I test, I validate an idea. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing with this in seeding startup communities, is that right? Yeah, actually, to answer that, um, it's important to mention that Startup Chile is full focus on this cultural shift. We, don't, we are not looking for job creation or economical, economical growth, short term, of course. What we want to do is to make sure that there are more Chileans becoming entrepreneurs, there are more angel investors that came from Chile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so in that line, one of the biggest issues that today the culture has is related with how we manage or how we see the failure. Um, the good news is that from the cultural perspective, today the, the community, the startup community already exists in Chile, so there are more people pushing for embrace failure and support failure and, and ask for help to people that already fail because they have a specific learning in, in, in that failure. Um, but the good thing is the government and the culture as, as a whole 
now is pushing more for that. So specifically, tomorrow, Wednesday, there is a law in the Congress that will be discussed to make sure we have companies creation in one day, but also uh, backroom, backroom C, um, laws that allows you, because today, if you fail, you will be punished by the bank at the end. Right. That's the, the reality. So we are making sure that not just we are creating the, the culture, but also we are creating the environment that allows you to be, become an entrepreneur, fails as much as you need, and then like progress and, be, and become successful. Great. Well, and, and you want to respond to that? I know we don't have a, a, a lot of time left, but I want to give each of our, of our panelists just uh, 30 seconds to, um, uh, to, to really add something you think uh, might have been missing. We've just scrapped, scraped the surface of this great discussion about sharing best practices across national boundaries. But uh, first of all, uh, uh, would, you, would you like to start if there's a, just a, a, a final thought you want to get across here? Well, um, <coughs> I'll, I'll, if you allow me, I'll talk a little bit about Khalifa Fund for Enterprise Development and the operating model that we've designed in the last five, five years. It, it continues to evolve, uh, and the objective is to uh, address all aspects of society. So if we talk about demographics of the population today, we have a very diverse uh, population uh, that previously was, un unlike what Abdul Bas said, was self-reliant on, on the government. So everyone wanted to have a job in the government. The direction now is basically the government is promoting and supporting the public sector, uh, putting a lot of investment into uh, uh, different sectors such as uh, semiconducting, aerospace, nuclear. And uh, what we hope to see is that we hope to see that the, the uh, small and medium enterprise, regardless of its nationality, uh, take serious consideration as to how can I provide a service or a product to these growing industries? How can I be part of that component, be part of the cluster? Um, and we are working very closely with, with a lot of these um, sector owners and, and putting together uh, a package for a small and medium enterprise to come forward, such as a venture capital fund, such as an industrial fund, which we'll be hearing very soon. Uh, and these are all objectives that uh, the government is saying to the economy to, and to SMEs that, you know, that we will continue to provide the access to finance regardless of how or where and, 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 and what is, is the objective, at least from, from the prospect of the government. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'll make it very brief. I think uh, if, I, if I give a story of, uh, of a person who came through our office and uh, his specific project uh, had uh, all the no's that the government can have. And I think that that person really made the call that regardless of all the obstacles that I will face, and he said this to me, and I told him, listen, I've been, I've been into this business for the past 10 years. That specific thing is a big no. And what that guy, that entrepreneur really said is, you know what, I'll give it a shot. And I think that's what is needed today. And uh, regardless of all the policies, all the things, we've seen in the harshest environments, I think the, the person, the entrepreneur that makes things happen. And that's my message really I want to leave for people, some of the people who are policy makers and some of them who are entrepreneurs or they have the idea. And I'm sure there are a lot of people sitting here. They have that idea. Don't worry, you will not die. Just go and do it, as simple as that. Wonderful. Hewlett? Now, <clears throat> I certainly agree with that. That is, some people are born entrepreneurs. Some we can actually train and we can hone their skills much better. And uh, as a result, I believe every society has their own fair share of entrepreneurs. No matter what you do, those people will just learn. Whenever they fall, they will keep, sort of get up and keep walking. But for those of us who come from the policy making side, we want to make sure that, number one, to have consistent policies across the board. So that is s crucial because that essentially don't let you, so you, otherwise you would waste time. That's important. Second is, rem remember that it takes time. Don't despair and things will take time and eventually we'll get into places. They're going to have lots of, <clears throat> just like in any startup business, this is like that. You have some wrong leads, but eventually things get there. Third is about education and environment. Education is needed, not only entrepreneurs, but to have a good workforce. <clears throat> the world is becoming extremely competitive these days. 
and what matters is the quality of human capital. And that is a must for every society, and that starts from primary school, actually even before that, all the way to university. That is the most important element to raise that, especially the small children. And finally, we create the right environment. An environment is really sometimes policymakers don't have any idea what's happening on the field. So you don't know, sometimes a small bureaucratic element would really hinder a lot of things. So it's really very imp it's important to have that environment for the entrepreneur to flourish. And the rest, I think, it seems like I've known this area for the last 10 years. It's, it's in the right direction. It's just a matter of time before things accelerate. That's usually what happens. It goes slowly and then takes off. Horatio. I have two final messages. Um, the first one is we are kind of successful principally because we are trying to hack the system. So more than a policy, if you really are convinced that you should do something that will work for your country or for your area, just make it and, and be uh, and be sure that you are working with people that is passionate about it and are convinced as you. And the second one is we in Startup Chile are opening a new application process on March next year, and we would love to have more entrepreneurs coming from this area. So if you are an entrepreneur or if you are close to a group of entrepreneurs, we will be more than happy to get you in Chile for six months. There the program go. is just for six months, then you're free to come back or go to wh wherever place you want to go. Awesome. <laughs> he wants to come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, conclude with a comment uh, respecting several things we heard today. I think the, 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 the first is that uh, as we work at the Kauffman Foundation in all these countries around the world, we have learned that it is indeed correct. Uh, there needs to be a different formula, particularly in the policy side, for every single country. The five or six primary barriers that are slowing down the scalability of firms and the ability of people to create new firms are different from every single country to every single country. Having said that, I think we should put more faith in the people who are in these communities of building entrepreneurs through them different methodologies because one of the things I have learned is that actually they have a lot more in common than I ever would have expected. And I think we should keep an open mind as we have visits to each other's countries to learn about uh, ways that we can uh, most effectively finance uh, our entrepreneurs and sometimes, by the way, that means we need to give them less money, <laughs> uh, and ways that we can help them. Um, and, and I think what we have to do at the Kauffman Foundation, we try to put this into a science. We call it the science of startups, the science of entrepreneurship, so that we've got more robust research and analysis of which interventions are actually having an impact, and which of them just sound good and seem to be working uh, in, in for as good PR. So I certainly think uh, th there is much to learn from each other. And uh, I, I, I want to end with allowing... Uh, yes, just, just one last thing about the, that guy that was... Uh, uh, he Actually, he was responsible because of his persistency to change that specific policy. And he opened the door for the rest after him to, to start their own businesses because of his persistence. So policymakers are people. But as the professor said, if entrepreneurs do not take the initiative, and uh, policymakers don't know it all, they're not gods, they're human beings. But if entrepreneurs do not take the initiative to bring these issues up and be persistent, things will not change. And this is how it all starts. Great. Well, I don't think we're allowed to take questions, are we? Or okay. So, but 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 we're going to be. Uh, I'm just uh, following instructions. But for anybody that would like to continue any of these conversations, I know I speak on behalf of the panelists. We're going to be around today. Uh, be happy to continue those conversations. Uh, and uh, want to thank very much um, uh, the United Arab Emirates for having us, the foreign guests, and thank you today for joining us in this conversation. <laughs>